Let us pray. Dear Lord, we sang earlier in the service today, opening our eyes. Please do open our eyes and open our ears and open our hearts and open our understanding. Your word is so beautiful and complex that two people could be sitting in the same place and hear something different but what they needed to hear. And so open us up to possibility, open us up to inspiration, and open us up that we might hear from on high. In Jesus' name, amen. Sermonic title today is We Are a Family, part two. I'd like to use as a subtitle, show up, show up. Nada grew up in a two-parent family home. She grew up in a community long ago that was close-knit and neighbors believed in hands-on love. I want you to use your imagination there. She also grew up in a community that talked, or shall I say gossip? In her teen years, she started to hear other people in her community say that her dad really wasn't her biological dad, but that her dad was another man on another street that she looked just like. She wasn't ready to quite tell her mom this information that she had heard, and so she kind of kept it to herself for a couple more years, but it danced in her head, could that be my dad? One day in her adult life, she found the nerves and the courage to ask her mom, Mom, is this person people are saying is my dad, my real dad? Her mom was emphatic, no, that is not your dad. The man that has raised you is your biological dad. Nada left it alone, went on living her life, but people would continue to gossip, people would continue to say it, and this other family, they treated her as though she was a part of their family. They would invite her to gatherings. They were like, you are our kin. We know you are related to us. And so after a period of time, she went back to her mom. But every time that Nada went back to her mom, her mom would be emphatic. This is not your dad. Don't listen to what people say in the streets. The man that raised you is your biological dad. As life goes, the dad that raised her died. As life goes, her mom died. And as life goes, eventually, the dad that was called her biological dad was ending the near of his life. Nada thought to herself, with her mom dead, maybe I should really look into this. And so Nada decided to do a DNA test. And guess what? Nada find out. The gossip was true. This man across the street, down the street, was really her biological dad. These people that had claimed she was related to them were, in fact, her people. It made all the difference in the world to her. But it also changed her. She began to think, what was her mother trying to prove? Why had her mom lied to her? Why had her mom been so emphatic that this man was not her dad? Not a found finding out where she really was from raised more questions. Nada decided from that moment on to never take people at their word. You have to show me. This is where we enter the biblical text today. According to John and Mary, they had seen Jesus. According to the Gospel of John, Mary had seen Jesus. And it was long before, and it wasn't long before he made a second appearance. And there were these other disciples that saw Jesus. And each of them were gathered in the room with others that hadn't seen him. And they were giving their twist on the story of seeing Jesus in wonder and amazement. You know, when you've been present for something, you just got to get in how it happened, how it appeared. This is what I saw. Reports of being with Jesus and seeing him alive in an empty tomb and the stone being rolled away. Thomas was not there, but he listened to the disciples explain what they saw and what they had heard. Thomas kind of was like Nada. For many of us today, if we're honest, that's a hard pill to swallow. It's a hard pill to swallow that a man died on Friday. We buried him, we put him in clothes, and three days later, he got up. And yet for Thomas, 
This was a hard pill to swallow. And so Thomas concluded, unless I see the nail holes in his hand, put my finger in the nail holes and stick my hand in his side, I don't believe what y'all saying. In other words, like Nada, you got to show me. Anybody willing to be honest that sometimes you feel like you got to show me? We live in a world where sometimes it feels like everyday good people are preyed on. All kinds of scams come in the mail. This week I got a notification that my package was on the way. But guess what, y'all? The label fell off, and all they needed me to do was click on the link and provide my address. Now I thought to myself, if you all are the carrier somewhere in your system, you should be able to find my mail. I mean, you should be able to find my address. Maybe they didn't get me, but I bet you they got someone with that scam. I bet you someone took and ate and got it. The alderman's office works real close, I learned, with seniors around the south side Bronzeville being targeted for scams. We hear the story of people investing their life savings with what turns out to be Ponzi schemes. Good people getting taken advantage of, from love to packages, empty words, and promises. I don't know about y'all, but you're going to have to show me. Take time, Thomas said, to show me so that I can believe too, because it just ain't flying me, with me what Mary and the disciples are saying. Showing up, taking time to help people get to a space of belief. Ruby Frank and her counselor, Jolie Hillerbrand, thought two of her kids were possessed by the devil. From their perspective, they were trying to get the devil out of these two kids. They did some extreme things. From the world's perspective, they abused these two kids. When the police arrived to a $5 million home complex based on the boy's testimony, who escaped, they are looking for his sister in this house. They search the whole complex over and they can't find her until they walk into a walk-in closet. And there is a girl sitting Indian style, still on the floor. On the floor. They speak to this girl sitting on the floor. They don't recognize the girl because her hair has been cut off. She says nothing back. She asks about the abuser, Jody. Where, where is Jody? She never moves from her position. They finally offer her pieces, pizza, something that resonates with her. She eats a whole pizza and half of another. They bring in a specialist to talk to her. It takes four hours for them to talk that girl out of the closet because she needed someone to show before she could believe that she was okay. It didn't matter that the first person that walked in said, I'm the police. I'm here to help you. She needed someone to show her. Sometimes people go through things in life and they just need somebody to show, to show up. The disciples are scared. They're looking, they're locking themselves up in the house. They're keeping a very low profile. We don't talk about that. The powers kill Jesus. They're scared. If they kill Jesus, what could they possibly do to us? Could we be next? This was a traumatic experience before it went good. The grief is so thick, visibility is a zero. We are three days into mourning the death of Jesus. And now you want to tell me you saw Jesus walking around? Does that not sound crazy to somebody? You want to label me as the doubter? Make me the bad guy for questioning? When was the last time one of your family members got up three days later? I mean, this stuff doesn't happen every day. Yeah, maybe folks die and come back in minutes, but we're talking dead, dead, wrapped in cloth and laid away with a tomb, stone in front of a tomb. Call me what you want, but if you want me to be a believer, you're going to have to do more than talk. You're going to have to show me. People of God, we are living in a time period where people need us to show them words they don't matter. Politicians and pastors, they speak such beautiful words. I know I'm standing here, right? Speak such beautiful words, but you got to show me. We want our elected officials in our churches to show us. We want our jobs in our hospitals to show us. We want our families and our friends and our loved ones to show us. We are running a deficit, we think, in money, but really we're running a deficit in people showing up and caring for one another. 
Deidre always wanted to be a mommy. This year she gave birth to a baby boy with Down syndrome. It took a minute. There was deep hurt because when we think about having a baby, we think of the baby being a certain way. This wasn't the baby that she envisioned, but once she got around it, she realized the most important thing for her to do was to show up for her baby. She found another Down syndrome boy older to be a role model. Now her baby's quite young, but she's excited. She shows him this video of this other younger toddler that has Down syndrome. She wants him to know there are heroes in the world that look like him. She shows up because that's what you do. Sometimes you have to get across town. Sometimes you have to cry. Sometimes it takes a while emotionally to get there. But it's important that we show up. Jesus shows up to meet Thomas where he is. It was eight days later when Jesus shows up. Thomas had some time to roll around in his head what others had said to him to kind of wrap his mind around it. Jesus walks right in and greets everyone, and then he focuses on Thomas. He dresses Thomas. Take your finger, Thomas, and examine my hands. Take your hand, Thomas, and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving, Thomas. Believe. Jesus didn't have to come back eight days later for Thomas. And Jesus didn't have to show Thomas a thing. But he met Thomas where he was. And that's good news. Maybe if we meet people where they are, we might be able to bring people along as the body of Christ. Jesus had this canny ability to meet folks where they were on the journey. He met the woman at the well. He met the people at the wedding right where they were. Sometimes we want people to be on our page. We want them to see it as we see it, to operate and behave as we do, to draw and operate inside the lines. But what if we showed up where people are? What if we met people where they are? Stop trying to get them to be where we are. Take the time to get across town. And let's stop shaming people for not being where we think they should be, doubting, faithless. Just get to where they are. Because our world needs people to show them more than anything else. Words, my friend, are cheap. I remember this ethic class I took very on very early on in my seminary education, the teacher in this ethics class asked us, before she started her class, what were the obstacle, obstacles to God for us in this class? That meaning, what were the things that, would, that we, would, we were doing as students in the class that would prevent others from accessing God? Well, we have one person in the class that cursed like a sailor, so one person raised their head and said, profanity. Profanity blocks me from accessing God. So we agreed, the whole class, no more profanity. We're not going to curse in class. But I remember this one sister from Korea. She said it was he language for God. I had heard professors talk about expanding our vocabulary and gender understanding of God. But when this girl broke down that because she had been through domestic violence, using he language for God made her see God as violent. And so we agreed in this class that we would not use he language for God. I did one better, and I've committed to not use male language for God since that class. In that class, I learned sometimes we make changes in our own behavior to show up for others. A lot of times we comment and feedback, and people want different things because they want to be able to access God in the worship experience. Years ago, early in my career, I did therapy with the girls in a group home. These girls were traumatized and severely mentally ill. They lived in a home together. And so there was this one girl I met with. She was very suspicious of therapy. And week after week, we met together. And week after week, she was hostile. And week after week, she didn't say anything. And week after week, I felt like a horrible therapist. I was also young and inexperienced, too. Nothing I tried, none of my education, none of my masters in social work helped me to break through to this girl. And then we realized she needed to be transported to see her dad in jail. This girl had lost her mom. She went off with a religious cult, and her mom never came back again. 
She began to be raised by her grandmother. She was angry. Nobody knew where her mother was. Her dad was in jail for a serious crime. She was cut off from the two people she loved the most. We found out her dad was in jail three hours of the way. And guess who got to drive her? Moi. On the first couple of drives, she commented on my driving. She was not impressed. <laughs> three hours, one way in a car, in a van with someone, you start talking. And everything I had tried to do in therapy happened on that van ride. On the ride back after we had seen her dad and eaten the snacks in jail that they provide, she would talk some more. We would get home about six, seven o'clock that evening. I later learned that driving three hours to the prison and staying in the prison two hours and driving three hours home translated to her as showing up. It translated as love. I would have never guessed that I would have still been in that room doing therapy, trying to get through. None of my fancy therapeutic skills would have worked. But she taught me something on that day. Sometimes we have to show up where people are. Eight hours communicated love. Sometimes we have to show up where people are in ways that are not comfortable to us. Sometimes to show up for people, we have to do things and we have to make changes in our own life. Sometimes to show up, we have to reappear. We have to drive across town. We have to drive miles to get to where people are. We have to be vulnerable. We have to appear in the darkness and the doubt. We have to meet people where they are. Jesus, Jesus met Thomas where he was. Thomas, touch me. Feel the nails in my hand. And because Jesus met Thomas where he was, Thomas believed in the resurrection of Jesus. And Thomas' response was, my master, my God. Amen.